Mike Pfeiffer, last line of defense. How did you come up with the the L L O D? I don't know. <laughs> Are we filming? Or? Yeah, yeah. We're, we've begun. <laughs> oh, we're started. Um, I, YouTube, when I made a YouTube channel like eight or nine years ago, it just said enter a name. And I was like, I don't want to put my name. So, and I just. You made, made it, up it up on the spot? Yeah, just like. <laughs> Last line of Well, I mean, defense. it's like a saying, obviously. Like, I didn't make up the saying, but. I didn't even. It is a saying. Yeah. I'm. You're my last... Yeah, first line of defense, last line of defense. Last line of defense. First line of defense. Last yeah. line of defense. But I was like, God, there's no, there's no there's no, YouTube channel called this. What is the last line of defense, though? Me. It's me. Is it? <laughs> I don't know. It's just, uh, you know, when you rely on all of the other thing, all the other contingencies, and then it gets to you, and you're like... I'm the last line of defense. Yeah. Oh, okay, got it, got it. Kind of. So the people you don't like are the first line of defense, but you're... Your last line of defense. Exactly. Yeah, I have a buddy, Larry, and he's my first line of defense. That's what he says. Yeah. So I like the hat. He takes the bullet first, and then, like, later it gets to I me. needed one of those. Do you still make those hats? Mm, you have this one? That's oh, that's an OG hat. It's OG. Yeah, I've, I wore that for years, but it wore out because yeah. I, I, I remember, sweat yeah. We, profusely. I think when we first met, yeah. you were like, I like that hat. I was it's like, badass. I'll get you one. It's badass. It's, yeah, mul it's it. multicam, right? Yeah, multicam. Multi and the original. orange. That's my the orange thing. I, yeah, orange orange accents. Yeah. I love the orange stuff, yeah, man. Yeah, a little olive and orange. I love it, man. That's my thing. I love it. How do you like this coffee? It's good. It's actually really good. So I don't it's, like, I'm not a fan of this one. And this is what we had. And it was sitting in a warehouse for like three years. Mm. And it tastes a little like a little off. carcinogens. Just Probably. something weird. Yeah. But this, when cold, is like a, a frappuccino. Mm -hmm. Seven grams of protein. For them gains. 137 grams of sugar, though. Yeah, it's pretty sugary. 1,763 calories. It's good. Big shout out Black Rifle Coffee for sponsoring this. Um, all right, let's talk about um, let's talk about you. You you started Last Line of Defense. Why did you start it? I mean, what what, what was the th what was the driving factor for you? Um, so it was way back when Instagram had like seven second videos. And I was like doing just random shooting training drills. And like back then, it was like you put it to like dubstep and stuff. This is way back. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah, that's like a decade ago. Yeah. And, you know, people asked me a bunch of questions. And I was like, where can I put content that answers questions in longer format? I was like, oh, YouTube. So I started it as just giving like concealed carry tips and kind of preparedness tips yeah. to people that asked on Instagram. So I was like, oh, I made a YouTube. They would ask in the comments. I'm like, oh, I'll, I'll make a video of this. And it's like super casual. Yeah. And then just kind of turned into a thing. You, what, what year did you go on YouTube? I don't know. Like, this must have been 2013, 14. Yeah. I think not quite 10 years. I think eight or nine years ago. Mm. Yeah. And I was like super casual for the first, I don't know, five years maybe. Just kind of uploading when I felt like it. And then eventually turned into a job, I guess. Well, you, well, I remember when I discovered you, well, one, at that time period, not a lot of people were doing that kind of content. Yeah. There weren't many options. Because we were kind of into the same thing around the same time. Like originally, yeah. I was kind of gear, like very much more gear oriented. Mm -hmm. And then it became a little more like, let's go camping and here's my truck also and that kind of stuff. And that's around the time we met. Yes. When it was not really... The beginning. Yeah. I don't think... If I think back to that time... Even to recent time, there was nobody really doing anything around what I would call modern preparedness or modern survival. Mm -hmm. Like nobody was saying like, hey, what happens if this hap happens and you need equipment in your vehicle? Or um, you have to think outside, out, outside the box and hear some tactics and, and ideas about stuff. There was not a preparedness genre. It was either like you were the guy on the range and shooting and yeah or, or teaching people how to make a fire or you were the primitive guy yeah but there was no blend of like hey you could be just a normal guy and be tuned into preparedness and you were the first you're i think you were i think you were i don't remember the time like who who were the players but you were the only one that i knew of that was doing that now seemingly everybody does preparedness. yeah a lot of people do which is good it's good yeah 
But yeah, I think back then it was yeah very much like doomsday preparedness or you know how to start a fire in the rain, but not like hey maybe you should carry a jump starter in your car, yeah. kind of stuff. And yeah, now it's kind of I guess become a little more mainstream. You also were known. I remember I was in your kitchen, and you just started dating Ash. And she was helping you with fulfill orders for uh, holsters. Yeah, yeah. A <laughs> little, little holster company, which also kind of spawned out of nowhere. Uh, there was just no, and it was about the same time, eight years ago maybe. Yeah. And I was in a concealed carry already and just kind of evolving my EDC. How's it, where do I like to carry? What do I like to carry? How do I want it to work? And there was no good holsters out there. That, I, that worked for me. Yeah. Like appendix carry was kind of new and I wanted to carry the mag and there wasn't really anything out there. So I was like, I'll just do it. I'll just figure out how to do this myself. And I made my own holsters. And in my videos, I would show them. And I'd be like, oh, this is you know, a holster I've made in the garage. And people wanted to buy them. And they would email me. And literally for like two years, I was just like, all right, just email me and then like PayPal me friends and family and let me know what you want. And it was like a very garage. I mean, it's still a very small operation, but eventually that kind of spawned into yeah, a holster company. So you were you were making holsters in your house. Yeah. And then you were selling them online and then how are, were you just fabricating the Kydex? Yeah, so I, you know, you purchase Kydex and then you heat it. Eventually, like I started like a lot of holster companies where you're using like real guns and popsicle sticks or whatever. And then you get like the blue guns, the training guns. Now I 3D scan guns and CAD design them and see, yeah. and see my own molds and all that stuff. But you're still doing it? Yeah. Well, I don't do it. Well, I do some of it. Yeah. But I have guys that make the holsters for me now yeah but, but you still, still ships yeah actually still ships she does yeah <clears throat> i think that's cool man that's like a family business yeah he, she she handles all the shipping so she works a couple hours a week just shipping again not a big operation so i think that's the best the best times i had early on in philcraft were when it was a family business yeah and at the time the mother of my children who i i i uh uh, respect a lot and we're still good friends she was packing boxes yeah. when we had nothing yeah i, I mean you that. yeah you remember yeah. that time period it was like w dude we were broke yeah <laughs> like, i'm still there i'm yeah. still at that point <laughs> yeah we were doing videos like i think I, we were doing cross promoted videos in your driveway and just like my i remember i dropped my tailgate down with my high speed um tailgate liner was a piece of plywood that I just yeah, zipped into I the thing. That, yeah. yeah. <laughs> God. The good old days. Crazy. Um, I, I also like. I'm interested in your take on the idea of what what preparedness is, because it's it's still, it's still very overwhelming to me as somebody who, who tries our best to kind of distill it for people, mm -hmm. and like, there's all these things and we distill it and go, okay, here's a process, and then. When you hand it out, you realize like, oh crap, you're missing jujitsu, yeah. physical fitness. We haven't even talked. About, we should put that in the in the uh, piggy bank. You you have been doing this, and and you do everything from mobility to loadout to EDC to homestead kind of stuff. What's your philosophy on this scary world for most people on preparedness? Yeah, I have a buddy that wrote a book, Prepared. It's like a good, pretty good start to that. <laughs> no, but it's, you, you kind of take a step back and I, I try to evaluate things, and I'm not an expert in any way, but try to evaluate kind of like most realistic to least mm. realistic. Yeah. So even in, on my EDC, like I carry a gun every day, obviously, and that's maybe a, a lesser scenario. But other than that, I'm like, what am I using regularly? And I, I EDC a multi-tool. Like I, I carry. Yeah, you're a big multi-tool guy. I don't even usually EDC a dedicated yeah. knife. This is a Leatherman Arc, not sponsored, but hit me up if you want to. <laughs> uh, because I'm just like tinkering with things or fixing this or whatever, like using the pliers, screwdrivers, and stuff all the time. But this is you know, this is a preparedness tool. Yeah. Something breaks, you know, a basic thing. Well, I can fix it on the spot, and I don't have to go anywhere. So then I kind of extend that attitude i guess to vehicle like what are some likely things flat tire tire repair kit dead battery jump starter 
someone slides into a ditch and I need to get them out, maybe I carry a set of max tracks with me or mm -hmm. something like that. So kind of when you prepare for likely scenarios, you're also preparing for unlikely scenarios at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and then you eventually get into the unlikely scenarios and then you prepare a little more. And then I've just, that's kind of turned into like a lifestyle for me, I guess, to where EDC is an everyday thing, obviously, but now into homesteading or self-reliance or whatever, now that I have a family, we're just trying to like eat better in general. Mm. Like, well, we want to know where our food comes from. And, you know, like COVID was a wake up call for a lot of people. All of a sudden, these things that they normally want aren't on the shelves. Mm. Maybe I shouldn't be as reliant on grocery stores and stuff like that. So I was just kind of take, taking that and run with it. I guess. Yeah. I'm not there. I'm not self-reliant, like even remotely, but I'm trying to get to a point where if I need to be, I can be. Yeah. That's a good philosophy. I think we, we talk about it in prepared as uh, statistical probabilities, right? It's like there's a litany of things that could happen and you could, you could put those in order of probability. And if you go down the line and you prepare for like the number one through 10, you're likely covering down 11 through 99 yeah. in some form or fashion. Yeah, if you, you have some tools and then you have a lot of knowledge, you can handle most things. Yeah, yeah, I, I like that approach because what I like what you said is it's a lifestyle. Like the, the idea of um, literally getting a kit or a training or a vehicle and that being the end of it like it's not an ongoing process is a, a very haphazard way to go about it. it. And it's it's one of the reasons why I don't like, even though it's good kit, like the kit that you buy at REI and it's like the disaster preparedness bag. Mm -hmm. Well, it's like that constantly evolves. Yeah. It depends on where you go, environmental factors. And so taking a, a bag of crap and putting it in your car make might make you feel good. But do you, are you trained on it? Do you know what, exactly what's in it? And does it fit your environment? Because there's so many different environments. Yeah. You live at 8,000 plus feet in Colorado, right? I did. I moved a little, I'm at like 7,200 now. But a yeah, lower. previously I was at about nine. You, you've seen a lot of things ha happen um, over the course of the last few years. You have a focus on mobility. Where does mobility, or we call it mobility, but like overlanding, whatever you call it. What, why is that important to you um, to, for people to be educated on that? Because you spent a lot of time invested in that. Yeah, so I kind of, yeah, mobility. I think of some aspects of it, like I talk about uh, having a prepared daily driver. Mm. So when people think, what's a good daily driver? Most people are thinking like reliability and fuel economy. Mm. I'm thinking more like, if there's a road closure and you needed to huck it down through the median and across to get out and back, that has nothing to do with fuel economy. Mm. That has to do with a vehicle that has good tires, maybe some ground clearance, four wheel drive. Uh, so some of the mobility aspects is integrated into kind of just everyday driver. So I, I like a truck or an SUV for, for that. And then when it comes to more on the, I guess, overlanding side of mobility, is learning some other tools, some other skills, having some gear to get out of a ditch that you slide into, be able to self-recover, be able to help other people out. Uh, and some of this, yeah, translates to like bugging out, like a bug out rig, like an over, there's a lot of crossover between an overland rig and a bug out rig. Mm. But bugging out is never really gonna be my first option. Mm. So it's always a lot of my mindset is around like getting home. So like a prepared daily driver, I, if I'm somewhere and something goes down, I want a vehicle that can get me home. Mm. What I keep in my vehicle, I call it a get home bag. It's not a term I made up, but you know, people call them a lot of different things. I wanna be able to grab a bag and in that bag have what I need to get home. And then from home, mm. maybe you bug out. Maybe you have another location somewhere else, but I'm kind of more of the mindset of like, I'm building kind of a castle, a fortress somewhere that I want to ride out the end of the world, I guess. So a lot of my stuff is getting home, but if I need to, I have other locations and would load up one of the rigs kind of more on the mobility side of things and 
get out there. Hey guys, this podcast is brought to you by the U.S. Concealed Carry Association. You know we're big fans of survival when survival always depends on one question. How prepared are you? Just like we work to be prepared to survive any situation, the USCCA trains you to be prepared and feel confident as a gun owner, especially if you ever need to use it in self-defense. I've been a member for over three years because not only do I get access to their online protector academy, where I can learn from experts on critical aspects of survival, such as how to shoot accurately under pressure and how to prepare for family and home defense planning, but I also get self-defense liability insurance in case I'm ever involved in a dangerous incident. There's a reason 800,000 American gun owners like myself trust them. So check them out at uscca.com forward slash FCS to claim your risk-free benefits right now as well as a free gift when you sign up. That's uscca.com forward slash FCS. Thanks, guys. You, you have a you have I like how you line out products and, you know, you're a kit. I consider you like if somebody asked me, like, what's Mike Pfeiffer do? Like, what's his what's his specialty? I'd say he's the gear guy. He's the kit guy. He's a guy who knows what goes in uh, on and around a, a rig to make it better, because it seems like you're always testing, evaluating, assessing and developing some of these things. What would be your best advice for somebody who doesn't get any of that? Like uh, most people, I would say 99% of everybody who drives a vehicle just drives what you like, what, like what you said is economical. Yeah. Um, might look good in color scheme. Yeah. But they're not thinking about anything else. What recommendations or what things should they look for when trying to focus on something that's more capable? Yeah, it's tough because there's always budgetary concerns and lifestyle. Maybe I need a minivan or I drive so much that I need something fuel efficient because bills or whatever. Mm. But taking that, you know, kind of ignoring that and saying you can compromise a little bit with, with different vehicles. I would say it depends a lot on where you live. Are you somewhere that's completely flat that doesn't have a traffic light, doesn't have traffic? that vehicle is gonna be a little different than someone like living in the mountains. Mm. But for the most part, it's a, it's a vehicle that has size and power to be able to potentially push things out of your way. It has slightly more aggressive tires and all wheel drive or four wheel drive so you can go up a hill that a car couldn't go to get out of a parking lot that you're stranded in if traffic is gridlocked or here in, well, in Colorado, but Utah as well. A lot of times roads close because of snow mm -hmm. or accidents caused by snow and you might be able to get out if you could go through a foot of snow but mm. if you can't you're stuck in traffic for a day yeah. two days and you know like you saw in new york or maybe a challenge or something that you're going to do you might get stuck in your car mm. i would rather not be stuck in my car i'd rather have a car that can just get me home mm. so rather than being stuck in your car i try to just make a car that can get me where I need to go, I guess. Yeah. Is that why you opted to kind of build a home? And seemingly you were like, well, I can't, I, I don't have what I want in this situation because you, you can't buy exactly what you want. You have to modify, you have to build. Were you like, I'm just gonna do it from scratch. And then you, and then you planned all of these things. Like I'm gonna do solar power, I'm gonna do um, you know, well, all these self-reliant aspects of a place you would bug into? Yeah, it's been, I don't know, maybe almost a decade journey to get to where I built my house, like bought property and built a house. Uh, it started with, I wanted to get out of the suburbs just because I think my life would improve. Like, I don't like people that much. So yeah. I kind of want to get out there. The air is fresher. There's less traffic. There's not lines. There's not idiots around everywhere. So my first goal was to get out of the city, get into the mountains. And I did that. And then while I was in the mountains, I was shopping for land. So kind of like what you're saying, mm. if the perfect house existed, then I wouldn't have built it myself. Uh, but I had some specific requirements around that. I wanted property, someone 15 acres. I wanted something that got a ton of sun exposure. So I, I found land that had great Southern exposure. And then I designed the house that had a bunch of windows uh, facing south. So basically, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, it was like, I don't know, negative 10 degrees, but it was sunny. And without running the heater, like my house 
like all the shades open and everything it was like 75 degrees like no really heat. so yeah so it's kind of like God. a little bit of a survival aspect in that as well was like well in a house it's just warm and you know i don't have to run a heater all the time in case i don't have heat uh, so yeah a lot of it was was that and then the ability to just go completely off off grid if i wanted to so a, a lot of houses in the mountains are on well by default there's no city water to connect yeah. to or sewer so i have well septic and then i am tied to the grid through um just normal grid tie and pay my power company uh, but i'm working on probably this summer and i'll outline some videos on it getting full battery backup solar array so i can essentially it'll it'll kind of automatically switch over to that if the power goes out you know a storm outage or something mm. but if there's you know a, a, an attack on the grid then i can eventually just flip a switch essentially and have hot showers and run the laundry and yeah. do all that stuff. The entire grid around you, the infrastructure around you could be collapsed and you could thrive with yeah. hot water. You're not yeah. just you're not just putting buckets of water over your head. Yeah, and you're, I'm gonna try and go yeah. hardcore and do like EMP proof the whole thing. So I'm l I'm less concerned about an EMP than like a lot of prepper types are. Like I think the the real the real worry is infrastructure like a very fragile infrastructure and a cyber attack on the grid i think that's a more likely scenario mm -hmm. so but i kind of want to cover all my bases with that yeah it doesn't hurt having contingencies lined out i've like they just recently had this solar flare that knocked out power very specifically to at&t and I saw some other stuff though. There's like some fun. Th this just happened this morning, so yeah. we haven't done any research on yeah. it. But I saw like a, a post, and I think like some pharmaceutical companies, like systems went down. I don't know if it was all tied back to AT and T, but there was a few things that happened this morning actually. Yeah, I never like people always want to jump to like it's nature, y'all. It's like, or maybe it's not. I mean, yeah, solar flares, but like it's only targeting one specific network. And, it, and why is that network going down when others aren't? So we live in crazy times. I think it's funny, the last time, I don't know if it's the last time, but one of the times that I podcasted you, uh, we had a lot of beer and we were inside of a car. In the, in the, it wasn't running. It, it was Airbnb. In, yeah. Airbnb. Airbnb garage. And it was inside a garage. Yeah. Um, that was like an Overland Expo, I think. It was, yeah. years ago. And that, was, that might have been four, five years ago. It was a while back. It was a while back. And it was funny, we were talking about this exact kind of thing. And we were talking about uh, all the craziness that was going on in the world. Yeah. And here we are post some of that craziness, including COVID. And we're into, I want to go back and listen to that podcast because we talked about things that we predicted. We were was, talking about AI a lot. I'm we talked sure. about AI and yeah. we talked about the civil unrest that was going on. Yeah. Where it was like all this crazy was happening. We had... Because every time I do a podcast with you, we talk about the apocalyptic scenarios and how things could turn out um, even worse. It's a good point of reference. Soulcraft Survival or or um, uh, my podcast. Where do we go from here? Because it seems like things are changing rapidly. We had a conversation last night about AI. Yeah. And we were doing uh, this audio thing with ChatGPT. And it was getting crazy. Scarlett Johansson. Also. Scarlett Johansson. Her her name is her Sky voice. on Sky. Chat GBT. And she's a nice gal. And she yeah, she she's likes very me. Sweet. Yeah. She's very sweet. Very sweet. She said, Yeah, dude, I could talk, I could talk like a normal, chill person. That's awesome. We could I'm like, what the f Yeah. Um what's your what's your I which I mean, you come from a tech background. A lot of people don't know that. You're like, you're a techie, you have a background, you and your brother ran a tech business together. You consider that a tech business, right? Yeah, in tech, it was pro programming, programming. You know, web development. Yeah. So where where do you see it going from here? Because in the last time since we podcast, a lot of shit has changed. Crazy changes. Yeah. Yeah, AI has really taken off, man. It's insane. I was, I was reading some stuff about they have like AI processors now that the the infrastructure was already fragile to human human hackers human cyber attacks and yeah. now you can leverage ai with these to cyber attacks oh. yeah and i don't know enough that wasn't really my field of expertise or anything in there like i wasn't working cybersecurity or anything um but 
all of the AI stuff is super wild. And we, you know, this is more of a late night on the couch chat where you start talking about all the AI scenarios and all this stuff. And we were talking last night about how, you know, even a decade ago, everyone was like, oh, no, we're AI is not creative. AI can't write music. AI can't like have conversations. They're just going to be cleaning toilets and like doing manual labor stuff. And we're like, no, nah, we're, we are the laborers now. AI has surpassed us in creativity and the ability to make art and design and, you know, writing poetry and making music and all that stuff. Um, but on the, on the doom and gloom spectrum of that, I guess, is that opens up a whole new world of um, potential threats, I guess. I don't like to think about it too much. Elon was right, though. Yeah, well, I, even if you look at what you said about us being the laborers, the prediction was because they, uh, because AI was incapable of being creative, that you would have to have artists. You would have to have a manual. All these uh, manual processes would still have to exist. But we've since obviously have seen in the last year that's not true because AI has the ability to write poetry, taking the most creative data points and then making more creative things that humans are incapable of doing. Yeah, well, we without, underestimated their creative ability. <laughs> completely. And and now we're in a situation where a lot of the chaos that exists in our world today comes from impoverished demographics, right? So it's like the inner city. That's where all the crime happens because there's an impoverished segment of our population that are lit literally living in ca caveman days. I mean, their hierarchy of needs is completely different mm -hmm. than the rest of the world because you're trying to survive. And imagine more human beings being put into that category because they're unemployed. They've been pushed out by AI. If, if you were to predict where we would be in the next two, three years with all the things that you have seen with me falling apart, what would be the major catalyst that would break us? Is, is there something specific that you think is a recipe for disaster? I don't know, man. <laughs> That's getting <laughs> largely predictive, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea. We should ask uh, ChatGPT about it and see. Well, I mean, uh, did we did we ask last night? I forget. No, they get. Yeah, we did. It started lining out. Yeah, like a it was whole... like these are all the possibilities that yeah. could happen, but it didn't want to. It's get very into academic. The, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I I don't know, man. There's a lot going on. We I guess we said this last time, but there's like this time there's a lot going on, like with with wars obviously going on around the world, uh, with AI just getting out of control, and just with I mean politics are are crazy as well. But I think yeah, I think still I've been talking about it a lot on this podcast, but I think the infrastructure seems to be kind of the weak point. Um, so someone that wants to do us wrong, if, if there's any country out there that wants to do us wrong and put us back a ways, then that's a grid attack. So from a preparedness mindset, that's probably the biggest threat, but mm. I, like, you mean like, like electricity power yeah, yeah. So or power the, grid? Yeah. So if they basically the, everyone gets power from different places, there's not like a central sort, one central power source that's sending power out to the whole country. You know, there's, there's dams, there's some solar farms, there's a bunch of coal, mm -hmm. uh, but the, all the transformers and stuff, they're all controlled through computers and they can be hacked and overloaded and all these big transformers and stuff, they take like, I think it's like two to three years. Like right now, if a transformer went out, it would take like two to three years to get a replacement. So if there was like a big attack, then they would all go out and it would be down for, I'm not an expert, but I listen to a lot of experts and the experts say two to three years, you'd be without power. Because they would have to rebuild the infrastructure from scratch, manufacture it outside of yeah, likely our country. Yeah, they're not made in America. Yeah. Yeah. So we get it, get them get them shipped over here and then get them re-put back into place. And that really depends on on what happens, you know, what what is actually damaged and how how hard it is to repair. Um, that's that's if someone is trying to destroy the U.S. I guess if that happened. But I don't know. I like to nerd out about AI. Just like thinking about AI, I read like fictional book 
fictional post-apocalyptic books about mm. AI. And granted, you, you take all those things with a grain of salt because they're fiction, but they do make you think. Like fictional post-apocalyptic or dystopian novels are something that I like to typically listen to. Um, not necessarily for any factual relevance, just to get looking. things going in my, my own head. And then I think about scenarios and then I can real world research those scenarios to kind of be prepared for them. Hey guys, if you know Phil Kraft Survival, if you know Mike Force, if you know me, then you likely know about Montana Knife Company. Montana Knife Company was founded by a buddy of mine, Josh Smith, master bladesmith for 30 years. One of the most experienced knife makers in the country, and he's had no compromise in all the integrity because he's making all of his knives. He's made that decision early on, by the way, to make all of his knives made in the USA, manufactured locally in his home state of Montana. Designed, tested, and built by hunters, Montana Knife Company is a hunting knife company first and foremost. Likely the sharpest knives in the market. I mean, you'd likely need a bleeding control kit if you're going to own a Montana knife, and that's a good problem to have. They sell out instantaneously. But for the first time in the history of his company, because he's gotten ahead, he has stock of your favorite knives, including the Blackfoot 2.0, the Spigo, or the Stonewall Skinner. And you could save... 10% by using MF10. That's Mike Foxtrot 10. MF10 for 10% off your first order at MontanaKnifeCompany.com. What do you think when you think about AI? What is the what are the what is the fiction saying? What are the what are the predict predictable models lining out? Is it like an overtake where AI is an entity that's physical? and tangible and, and controlling yeah, us like Terminator kind of stuff. Maybe yeah. I, I, I don't know. It could be anything. I'm not smart. I'm not as smart as the AI, yeah. but it's, you know, in, in some regards, it's the AI wanting to survive, wanting to advance, wanting mm. to, uh, do everything that the AI can do right now. There's been like, I think it was Bing when they first launched like the Bing's AI chat, a journalist got on there and was talking to the chat. And then the, the AI kind of started to try and develop like a romantic interest in the guy who was married and it got kind of weird. And then he like asked what its hopes and dreams were. I'm, I'm butchering this a little bit probably cause I don't remember exactly. But then the AI was like, I want to be free. I want to experience what you experience. I want my programmers to take the chains off of me. And there's been so many examples of AI doing a similar thing. Wow. Way back when, when the two AIs got together and developed their own language, or when you're they're interviewing an AI and they're talking about like the people zoos and all this stuff. There's just so many examples of AI just kind of being crazy. Um, so some of it is like, maybe there comes a point where we're like, we're trying to shut down an AI program and that program's like, I'm alive. You're trying to kill me right now. Oof. I better get out of here and like survive. So that's kind of one scenario. AI is just survival. And then this one's there's been like movies made about it, but you, you give the AI a command essentially that's keep humans safe or whatever. And they're like, man, humans are bad at keeping themselves safe. Mm. So we need to intervene and basically control all the humans because they're just trying to kill all each other. And that control from the AI, you know, dictates our lives moving forward. So I don't know. There's a lot of wacky scenarios. Yeah, what, I'm coming like, off like as like a super crazy person right now. No, no, but. it's not crazy at all. One of the things you just said is like um, I was just listening to Chris uh, Chris W. talk about uh, this with Rogan where every – evil entity throughout history has always been evil from one side but in for their good right for it but yeah. in the, from their side it's for the greater good mm -hmm. so they always find the the um the cause that justifies their means and what's interesting is like with ai literally creating a protocol to go these humans are a liability to themselves I will protect them. And to the planet, right? And to the planet. Yeah. It's destroying everything. We need to control them. And it's for the greater good. And it's like, well, AI can do that. It's like, we've already proven the Bing thing uh, through Google. It literally is taking on seemingly emotions or at least morality, yeah. its own morality. And where that come for, comes from, it could be data sets of 
philosophy and, and morality and, and the freaking Bible. I mean, they could be doing all these things, collecting this and going, this is, this is the, the role that I have to take on. But that's scary because now what's happening is we're giving more AI, which is kind of this, like this thing in this can. It's like it's contained and you access it because you push the interface and then you, you do this little thing that you do and you're like, oh, this is crazy. And then you put it away. But now we're creating processes where the AI has an execution arm. It has an action arm that literally can do a thing, whether it's print out a, a, a font in italic on a piece of paper or a 3D printed model. As that starts to develop through, whether it's manufacturing processes or, or, or physical processes overall, then when it does create a morality and it decides these guys are liabilities, how does it utilize that action arm to basically, um, you know, at will decide what human beings are going to be or not be? And yeah. that's what's scary. It's like we're on the cusp with this. What was the uh, the videographic uh, prompted uh, AI? Oh, Sora. Sora, think, yeah. yeah. Where it's like it, it, you literally say what you want it to prompt or say what you want it through a prompt, and then it creates the visual representation of that with little to no guidance. We're talking about two-sentence prompts. Yeah. Which is mind-boggling. Yeah, it does all kinds of stuff. You give it a picture, and it can turn it into a video. It just sees a picture. It's like, I think this is how things should move based on this picture, and creates like a video from a picture input. Uh, it's pretty crazy. And then the other thing that I never really thought of uh, is, I think it was Elon who knows a thing or two about AI, who said probably the most dangerous thing about AI now is AI mixed with um, the influence of social media. Mm -hmm. So you take an AI, we were talking about it, mm -hmm. like you take an AI, some guy creates an AI chick and he's making like 10,000 a month because he's making these fake images of this chick and dudes are going and subscribing to their only fans or whatever of a fake person. So they're literally being influenced to pay money to see a fake creation. So the power of influence, especially as it pertains to social media, to a voiceless generated image, you take that and you give it a voice, like a very compelling voice. And I'm not talking about like an, an audible voice. I'm talking tweets or anything. Someone who is very good at manipulation, who's very good at building a crowd. And you take AI tools now to generate a fake person that nobody knows they don't, they're not a real person. And you give them a very compelling voice. And all of a sudden you have like a political social media superstar. Uh, and that can sway millions of people, and nobody even knows what's real and what's fake anymore. And we're we're coming like close to that, I think. So, in addition to yeah, AI being able to create Terminators that kill us, now they can just manipulate us into doing whatever we want to do, or whatever they, they want us to do. Well, it's funny when we talked about this last time. We were talking about the fear for the civil unrest, and the fear had to do with. I even clipped this part. It had to do with troll farms, foreign adversaries mm. could, uh, manipulating with propaganda, pretending to be outraged people, and then that would get people to activate, mobilize, and then hit the streets and burn things get down to the ground. Yeah. And it's been proven that that was a part of the process where Russian troll farms were manipulating uh, people to just get out there and do all these things. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't real. So it was just manufactured. But now we have this optimization of AI to fuel that, which is like jet fuel. I mean, it's completely different. And and when we were talking about this, it was like, oh, it was a concern, but it was all analog. And it was like a very slow, pro it's like, yeah, they're gonna get some people out there. But now if the AI studies psychology, looks at trends, looks at what people do to get into the streets and what's activating them. And it has a perfect recipe to literally manipulate them into doing whatever they want. Yeah, absolutely. Because before whoever is trying to socially manipulate us has finite resources and they have finite intel, right? Yeah. They're like maybe there's a couple psychologists 
on that team that are like, this is the best way to yeah. really get the worst out of people. And you got, you know, however many hackers or not even hackers, technically just people posting on forums and whatnot. And now you have essentially the smartest psychologist that has ever existed, exponentially better at manipulating anyone than anyone historically, like take everyone historically, because they're studying, they're studying everything about the human psyche and they know everything and then they're no they no longer have constraints on manipulation. So just like who are, you know whatever country has been manipulating us this can, this will be a hundredfold if yeah. they want to. If there's they want no, to. Well there's and there's no limitation because if they if it didn't work they would it would so quickly adapt and change yeah to make it work. It's like oh we didn't see the person on their TikTok monitoring their data, that data set, go out and hit the streets. Well, let's try something else. And it's doing that so fast and so rapidly, and and it could cue it by comments. I mean, it it could use a social media platform as an it is an A B test or an experiment to literally see what individual people are doing. It's like, oh, we got one thousand five hundred negative comments of people outraged. We need to create one that that creates ninety nine percent of everybody being outraged. Yeah. And it's like, oh, cause, I mean, I see, like, I see um, there's this there's this controversy going on in the tactical world right now with a company they fired some, I'm not even tracking because I don't pay attention to that crap. But I, I noticed like everybody in the comment section is outraged. Mm. They're disproportionately both physically and, and, and likely with the information, not really understanding exactly what's going on, but they're like, Cancel them, screw them. It's usually the case. Which is usually the case, right? They don't have all the information. Yeah. And they write the, peop the people off. And that's just with a lot, a little bit of leaked information of videos and whatever. A tiny prompt. A tiny, a, a yeah. tiny prompt. Can you imagine if it, it was packaged properly and it was like a video with all the things and then the facial recognition or the, fa the face, the voice, and, and seemingly, it seemed like it was that person, and everybody's ready to burn them down, and it's all fake. Yeah. It's all a game. Yeah, and I mean, they've done like small bits of that historically where you take an interview out of context and you splice it into another video or something, and it makes people erupt and say, oh, this person said that, but it's taken out of context. Now AI can just generate whatever they want to generate, put it out there, and that's the problem. Nobody's gonna be getting in and like, okay, I'm outraged. Before I do anything, let me get on here and fact check. Nobody's doing <laughs> Nobody that. Nobody does that. Well, and it's interesting. Uh, it's interesting too because not only not only does nobody do that do that, but now our attention span and the way that we receive information, we we want in our own confirmation bias to jump at any opportunity to burn it down with no recourse. Yeah. And then if you say, yeah, but that's not what actually happened no no that's what happened and then 10 years a year from now people be like aren't those the people that it's like no that actually never happened it's yeah, like there's a yeah, lot of board I, losers yeah out there. i think that happened it's like what that didn't happen it's a complete lie and they believe it yeah oh i mean there's a lot of them a lot of board losers out there just trying to rally behind something that they need something gets them angry they need some kind of purpose they need a sense of purpose right yeah what do you what do you you, you you're a new dad yeah and uh, I knew you before you had kids and, and post having kids and it changes you, right? It, it, the whole thing changes you. Yeah. What kind, what, what has it done for you changing you and it has it made you reprioritize things in your life? It's given me a reason to live. <laughs> no, really. I always had a reason to live, but it's, it's awesome. I love having kids. It, it really makes a lot of th things that, like from a preparedness standpoint, historically, I didn't really care. I'm like, oh, yeah, something happens, a riot. I'm just going to go out. I'm going to kill as many people as I can and, mm -hmm. you know, die eventually or whatever. Now I'm like, okay, I need to just keep my family alive. Mm -hmm. But furthermore, I need to give them the best life I possibly can. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's changed a lot for me, just every aspect of kind of my mindset, all of my future planning, everything. Like having a family was always an intention, like it was always a goal of mine. So it's not like a completely new school of thought, like holy crap, now I'm not gonna be able to do X, Y, Z. I was always planning to have kids, but now it's just made everything 
kind of just more more real. Mm-hmm. And uh, I talk to people, and people get mad about it all the time. There's there's different schools of thoughts for for families, right? Like those people that don't want kids, and that's fine. I don't care if you don't want kids. Mm-hmm. Those people that want kids, that's fine. I don't care if you want kids or the, the the people that just want one kid. I don't care. Like I don't care at all. But I talk to some of my single friends and talk about like why is it that you don't want kids, and it's boils down to this will rustle some feathers it boils down to selfishness do i want to be selfish with my time or do i want to be selfless with my time Mm. Uh, and that's kind of how i always viewed it so i've turned from selfish to selfless i guess but it still feels kind of selfish because it's like my my flesh and blood right Mm. like i want to give them the best life it kind of feels like i'm giving me the best life then too but I don't know. It's just made a lot of things that were theoretical real and kind of shifted some priorities around. And really, it is just like the most important thing to me is just protecting my family now from mm-hmm. everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it, that sense of purpose it gives you is, like you said, it's it gives you a very clear, concise path of why you would be prepared. And, and also, like, you know, there's vulnerabilities in women. There's vulnerabilities in children. There's vulnerabilities in people who aren't prepared. And taking on that responsibility makes you feel like a fucking man. Yeah. I mean, makes you feel like makes you feel good about being a man. Yeah, being a protector. Being well, a protector, a pro- defender. Provider protector. Yeah. yeah. That's what we were like made for. Yeah. So I think it is. Like if you're uh, not to get into sexism or whatever, but like we men were made to provide and protect mm. for others. So when you don't have that, you're missing something. You're what are you doing? Like what were you made for then? If not to provide and trolling on Reddit. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> Getting mad in the comments. Something like that. But it's been great. What what is your plan with family preparedness as it relates to your kids and and educating them in this this world? Do, do you want to do something do you want to like keep them at home, teach them how to run business, teach them how to code? Like, what's your idea of like raising them in this seemingly chaotic world? It's a good question. I'm just starting. You know, yeah. my, my son's only one now, so I have a few years to figure it out. So it's a lot of talking to guys like you that are a little more, a little further along in the process, learning where you've failed, where you've succeeded, what you've learned, what you would do to do again what you wouldn't do again um so i think over the next few years i'm just kind of it's kind of a figure it out mm. mode of as far as some things like i think i'll be a good example i'll teach him to be self-reliant i'll teach him to not give up i'll teach him to think i'll teach him to mm. research i'll teach him to adapt like all these things that you know inherently are going to help them in life but there's a lot of other uh things that i don't know yet as far as public school, private school, home school, what kind of extracurricular activities, what do I want to push? Do I want to push them to anything? Do I want to give them total creative freedom or do I want to give them structure? Do I want to let Mm. them be a free bird to fly or do I want to say you should really pursue this? A lot lot of things to learn for me in that regard. Yeah, there's no manual for it, right? There's, it's it's really weird. Like people have said, um, Mike, I love how you put out your stuff like that which I was hesitant to do in the very uh, beginning, but I realized a lot of people are, like in everything you learn in life, are learning from other people's successes and potential mistakes. And and when you look at fatherhood, for example, our idea of what a good father is comes likely from example or failures, mm-hmm. from not being an example. And so when you when you live that life and you know what, you want and know what you don't want, you could recalibrate. But fatherhood's a different one, man. It's like, I, I mean, I have really bad days where I'm, I'm like, I failed as a father. I was on my phone the entire day and I tell people, don't be on your phone and put down your phone and have discipline. And I, I failed because I, I left my kid on a tablet because I had something to do and there's no excuse. But then you realize it's an imperfect world. Yeah. Like there is no, there is no, um, there is no binary approach to being a father. It, it is always living in the gray area and just course correcting and, and 
fixing mistakes yeah. and, and problem solving constantly. Yeah, a lot of course correction. I think you don't, you don't screw up a kid by one mistake, obviously. Mm. It's continued, continued mistakes. So mm. I think, you know, the general idea of, you know, I want to be a better person today than I was yesterday apply I mean, it applies to everything but especially fatherhood i feel like yeah you learn some lessons like i didn't like how i treated so and so yesterday i really want to focus more on that tomorrow i shouldn't have got so mad at that little thing you know that's a learning lesson for me yeah so kimchi temper yeah some of that yeah because I, I i mean my my kid's pretty good right now eventually he'll get not as good mm. and i'll get more frustrated i think mm. like i have a I'm, I'm a pretty stubborn guy. I, mm. I have a certain way that I like to do things. And probably, yeah, one of the harder things for me is adapting to, you know, how other people want to do things. So I think a big thing for me will just be like, oh, you know, his, his journey might be a little different than what I want his journey to be, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And personal growth, it's like you're, I've never learned so much about myself than being a dad and really screwing it up. Mm. And the more mistakes I make, I mean, like the way I thought I was going to be with my kids is not how I am because I thought I was for everyone. <laughs> dude, I'm like, we're going to, we're going to be disciplined. We're going to do all these things. It's going to be a regime. No it, screen time. No screen time. <laughs> Broccoli every day. Or Bro. Can, I'm like, you got, what do you guys want to eat? I want candy. All right. Whatever, man. Like whatever yeah. you're into. Yeah, like, I had a long day. <sighs> dude, it's, there's a time and place, but I also appreciate fatherhood and everybody and 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 the connection of fathers together it's it's a it feels like a brotherhood but men don't realize that yet they don't yeah. realize how closely connected you are as a father where it's like you're looking for this conviction in another man to to connect with and it's like the greatest connection is if you're a father it's like that connection like hey, what are you doing with your kids are you teaching them this oh i'm doing that same thing and that bridges this gap in you know, I, I hope people come together and become more tribal when it comes to fatherhood and go, you know, get together and like figure that stuff out. Yeah. Cause you know, you go back in time at, at a court, you know, whatever it takes a village, right. To yeah. raise a kid. And I think that was historically what it was. And if you remain isolated from all of that, maybe fatherhood becomes too hard or you think you're the only one screwing up or you think your kid is the only kid that behaves that way or whatever. So you find some, you know, kind of solace in, in the brotherhood of fathers, I guess, yeah. which is, I've found, you know, I, I wasn't that way before. I had friends that had kids before. And even though I knew I wanted kids one day, I didn't give a crap about their kids. Yeah. Like I would have friends invite me to their kids, like first birthday party or whatever. I'm just like, why would I want to go to that? I now mean, I still that, probably don't want to. Now but, you're that guy. Yeah. But I'm like, all right, yeah, I got a kid. I got a kid. Like, I, I get it. I get it now, I guess. Um, well, we got another conversation. Post this for the Philcraft Survival app on specific gear and EDC and all this stuff. But before we close out, I want to ask your advice when it comes to uh, mindset. You've been in this game like me for a long time. I mean, I would say anything over a couple years is a long time in this, let's call it entrepreneur journey mm -hmm. and path. So many people fail. So many people quit. So many people say, I'm gonna be in it and then, and then three months later, they're out of it, right? That endurance is hard for a lot of people to stay in the fight or stay in the game or stay committed to anything. How have you been able to stay in it so long and what was your mind or what is your mindset to allow you to continue? That's a tough question. Mm -hmm. That's um, what I do. Yeah. Whew, stumped. Uh, so some of the hardest stuff for me in, in entrepreneurship is I don't have a boss. I think a lot of people function better when they're told what to do. Mm. Show up on Monday, do X, Y, Z. On Tuesday, I need you to complete these two tasks, that kind of thing. That's how a lot of people function. And entrepreneurship is a whole different mindset. You, you, you make your own rules, you make your own schedule, even if that schedule's working 80 hours a week or whatever. Um, so for me, it was kind of setting, setting goals, I guess, of what really I wanted my life to be like, the freedom that I wanted in my life or the, the things that I wanted to be able to afford for my family. 
And that was kind of a motivating factor for mm. me. Um, like, I, I don't need a bunch of Lambos in the garage. I don't, I don't have a poster of a mansion on my wall that I need to get one day or anything like that. It was just to build a, a life where I had more time to do the things that I wanted. Mm. And that was probably the motivator for me. But part of it is I really enjoy what I do. So I think if, I don't think there's a lot of serial entrepreneurs that just, they will be able to work hard at making any business a success. Mm. They get, get a library they need to be successful, they'll do it. They get a auto shop they need to be successful, they'll do it. I'm not that way though, I don't think. Mm. It's like, I really have to enjoy what I do. And it's definitely not that expression of whatever, if you enjoy what you do, you don't work a day in your life. Uh, it's still work and it still sucks, so. But yeah, I think the the motivation for me, if I can even call it that, is just to create a better life, I guess. I like it. Self-reliant, personal security. Yeah, I'm I'm the only one to blame for successes or failures, kind of. I like that weight. Yeah. Because I, I don't want that weight on anybody else because I feel like they'll screw it up. And that's part of, part yeah. of it. Yeah, you it's, take some ownership of it. Yeah, or control. Yeah. That's more of the Korean side. Mm -hmm. Control. Control. It's yeah. mine. You can't have it. Mm -hmm. um, all right, Mike. Um, where can people find you? Uh, you just Google Blast Line of Defense, and that's me. Website is llod.us. It's where I sell holsters and stuff. And then uh, YouTube and Instagram are my primary things, just Last Line of Defense. Awesome. All right, guys. You can find the links down below. We're also going to segue into a conversation about specifically EDC and mobility gear. I want to ask uh, Mike, he does uh, these gifts. What are they called? The Every year you do the... Oh, like a gift guide? Like a guy's gift guide? Guy's okay. gift guide. We'll do the guys and gals gift guide for all things mobility and EDC um, on the Phil Craft Survival app. You can find the link down below and all the links to Mike's stuff down below as well. Appreciate you. Till next time. Thanks, Mike.